Think Tech Hawaii. Civil engagement lives here. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Working Together on Think Tech Hawaii, where we discuss the impact of change on workers, employers, and the economy. I'm your host, Cheryl Crozier Garcia, inviting you to join in the conversation. Please call us with your questions or comments at area code 808-374-2014 or tweet us at thinktechhi. Recently, words like corruption, collusion, and obstruction have dominated the news cycle. Today, we're going to give everyone a break from discussing those terms in the context of U.S. politics and turn our attention to another big money industry, sports. The Federation Internationale de Football Association, or FIFA, has been the subject of an FBI investigation which uncovered corruption at virtually every level of the organization. In fact, some analysts have said that FIFA is more corrupt than the government of North Korea. Joining us today is coach Darren Vorderbergi, head basketball coach for the HPU Sharks, we're going to discuss recent revelations about FIFA and the implications of that investigation for the sport and for all sports. Welcome, Coach. Well, thank you for having me. Thank you for being here. Yeah. Now, corruption in sports. Yeah. I guess the first thing we have to uh, uh, make clear is that in a lot of ways, sports, uh, in leagues like FIFA, mm -hmm. the NFL, the NBA, all of the above, is more than just people competing on the playing right. field. It's also a business, and a very big business, where millions of dollars change hands. Um, tell us about how that perhaps might breed uh, an environment in which corruption can thrive. I think that's a great way to start a discussion like this, in that it is more than what most of us view as just the competition on the field or on the court. Uh, that's what we think of when we think of the NBA, or when we think of FIFA, we think of all the teams around the world that play soccer, but there's huge organizations behind those. Each team has its own administrative level, and, and then you've got the, the league administrative levels. And, you know, so many times that, uh, that gamemanship, that competitive drive, uh, you know, that, that's funneled through players and that's funneled up into the administration. Mm -hmm. And whereas it's uh, maybe a little easier to monitor, this is a foul or this was out of bounds for the play that happens on the court, uh, it is harder to manage what's going on off the court and the rules and regulations. And many of the, the items of corruption that we've seen are, are not for competitive advantage. Some of them are, and we can talk about those. But the FIFA one, for example, I, you know, when you are getting kickbacks to try to um, be part of the decision of who's going to get to host the next World Cup, uh, it really wasn't a competitive thing. That was a greed thing. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think... That shows that a lot of times at that administrative level, it becomes, you know, how can I make a quick buck or what can I do to, to further my bank account? Mm -hmm. There's a profit motive, yes. not, not just a winning motive. Right. And I, I think with FIFA, that was dramatically the case. Most of that was done at the, you know, the, the, the if FIFA administrative level. They're just trying to promote their sport. They're not interested in who wins or who loses. Mm -hmm. uh, they're simply looking at, hey, how do we manage and run this sport? And then some of them, how can I make money individually? Right. And there's no rule book for the administrators, is there? Well, I mean, every sport has a rule book that says, for example, home plate is 17 and a half inches wide. Right. Right. Or that uh, a basketball court m must be this long and this wide and have this kind of these kinds of lines drawn on them. But there's no corollary rule book for the administrators. Right, and it depends on the level. You know, the, the NCAA has legislation and right. rules that right. it monitors athletic directors and universities by and, and compliance uh, officers. Um, the professional level has that. You know, the NBA, the NFL, Major League Baseball, they have salary caps and when teams can begin practicing and when management can talk to players and when they can sign players. 
But, um, you know, a lot of the rule book that has been broken in recent scandals are laws. It's, it's, mm -hmm, it's, not mm -hmm. a, it's not a competitive rules thing. It's, hey, we're giving money to this person and that's inappropriate, or, you know, we're taking kickbacks on something because we've got some influence there. So you're right, there's a lot of different hands in play, whether it's competitive rules, whether it's management, or whether it's just the law. And then on top of that is just the, the integrity issue of it, you know. Uh, right. Is it, is it in proper character? Yeah. Well, I think, you know, that's the reason why the FBI became the leading investigator and really the agency that broke the whole FIFA uh, case, because um, in many cases, U.S. banks were used, where the kickback was paid to a person via, say, a deposit from a U.S. to a U.S. bank or a withdrawal from a U.S. bank. And the, if the U.S. banks were used, that's how the FBI can get involved. Right. And because the U.S. doesn't have a huge soccer culture, um, the FBI, there's no, there doesn't have to be any shame in their game, you know, as far right. as who gets busted, uh, how they get busted, where the indictments go, uh, who gets called before the courts, et cetera. Because it's not, for them, it's not an issue of, of um, embarrassing their favorite club sure. or taking taking an action that would adversely affect a sport that's huge you know i just i wonder if they they would take the same action if it were nfl administrators or mlb administrators or some other sport that has a huge following in the us yeah great points because uh, you, you know, a couple things have happened just recently. First of all, America failed to qualify for the World Cup. And right. Well, that's first... nothing new. Well, <laughs> we, we have and have not at times. But I've heard discussion that, that they always feel like when that happens, it sets America's soccer back a little bit. Because, you know, when the World Cup, as it's going on right now, people are watching it. And there's always, uh, you, you hear 15 years later, some uh, professional player when I was seven years old, I watched the World Cup, and, and it made an impact on me. So I, I think that that hurts American soccer. You know, I think it hurts any country that doesn't get in as far as promoting the culture. But you've, we've heard for years that American soccer is on the brink of exploding, that it's, it's coming, that we're going to become like the rest of the world and, and place an importance on it. So I, I think that had a, a detriment on our, on our soccer culture here in America. And then I don't think this helps. You know, I... I think not making the World Cup might have a larger impact on, on young people because they see that or don't see it on TV. Most of them aren't reading the newspaper or following the news or even see the blip that this makes on Sports Center. But it definitely is not going to help you know, America as it tries to grow in the soccer culture. Mm -hmm. uh, you make the interesting point, what if this was a different organization? And, and we've seen some of that. We've seen... Uh, the, the national anthem, I don't know if you'd call that a scandal, but, you know, we saw that, boy, the NFL went to great lengths to jump on, you know, this is an administrative thing, are the, are the owners allowing this or not allowing this, and there's a differing there, and what's the stance of the front office going to be? Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, I think had it, had it been nearer or dearer to a, America's heart uh, of the NFL or the NBA or NASCAR or something like that, <laughs> Uh, had, it, had it hit a sport closer to home, we, we would have seen more in the news about it and, and there'd have been more of an attempt to, to spin it properly. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You bring up two interesting points with, with that statement. First of all, is NASCAR a sport? <laughs> and I'm not, I don't know, we could, we could talk about well, that. Well, my son I, says no, but my son also says golf is not a sport, and I believe that they both are. So I think the, the, the sport is in the eye of the beholder. Okay, <laughs> I, I, would, I would kind of agree that maybe golf is not a sport. <laughs> it's certainly a game, yes, but, it I, is. but I don't know that it's a sport. Right. Um, Anything you can do with a cigar between your lips uh, and a beer in your hand, I'm not sure. Where you don't even have to carry your own equipment, not really sure that that Let's qualifies. Let's just hope that the NASCAR guys aren't driving with a cigar in their lips or a beer in their hand. That would be tragic. <laughs> well, I don't know. I, I've got family uh, in, 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 the, uh, in the U.S. South oh, there who, you go. who would not only say that NASCAR is a sport, uh, but they would also say that it should probably be the national sport. That's right. And that anyone that doesn't like it is like an enemy. 
That's right. Of, They're uh, very enemy passionate the fans. That's right. They, I wondered when I visited them, for example, uh, it's not unusual to see numbers on, yeah, on, on numbers. personal vehicles. And I, I thought to, I looked at that, I was like, man, there's a lot of fleet cars around, you know, thinking that they would, right. they were companies' fleet cars. That was Dale Jr.'s number. That's right. It was always a three. It was like, what's up? Well, apparently, I was, I was schooled uh, most energetically by relatives who said, no, 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 no. People put the numbers of their favorite mm -hmm. driver on their cars, and a lot of times it's Dale Jr. <laughs> so yeah. Um, And now we're completely off topic. <laughs> That's fine. Because my, my thought, what, I, what was I thinking? Oh, soccer. Uh, you know, you talked about little kids maybe looking at the U.S. not getting into the World Cup and maybe being less motivated to pursue soccer as a sport. Um, I don't know, though. I mean, I could see maybe where the boys might be. Uh, right getting, uh, becoming more interested in, say, uh, another sport rather than soccer because of the World Cup. But when we look at ath female athletes like Mia Hamm and, and Brandi Christensen, I think we see a lot of girls saying, I want to be like her. Right. And, and I, I think you're right on. And I think we're saying the same thing because, um, you know, Mia and Brandi are, are kind of past their prime now. And I'm not sure we've got, we've had that. But that we've had that recently, but the impact that they had when Brandy took her top off and slid on her knees and, and, and you know, Mia was so marketable, that pulled people into the sport. And I think that opportunity would have presented itself had America been in the World Cup. Who knows who that guy would have been that, mm -hmm. that hit that game winning goal or had that look about him or some fancy post gold dance that he does. And we'll miss out on that now. I mean, that guy might be out there, but young Americans don't see that. And I, I just think back to when I was a kid that, um, you know, I, uh, looking at Larry Bird, he was a few years older than me. We all had players that we, we looked at and, and it inspired you to get into that sport. When you practiced, you thought of them. And, you know, kids still do that today. Kids love Steph Curry. Everybody, they, they you know, because he looks young and he, He's got a mouthpiece hanging out of his mouth, and he kind of does little dances when he when he makes baskets, and and I think that's where I've heard the the consternation about you know that won't happen with this year's World Cup in America, and, mm -hmm. and for a lot of young people, that's the only soccer that's the only time they watch the American team play soccer, unless you're already a hardcore fan and you're following mm -hmm. the, the MLS. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I remember attending a uh, uh, World Cup final game viewing in 2010. It was Germany versus Uruguay. Yeah. Yeah. And I, uh, the only reason I was there was because uh, I was at the SHRM Society for Human Resource Management International Conference. And as a person who has a global HR certification, I was invited to the last party. Um, and everybody that had the same certification was invited uh -huh. to that viewing. And it was um, the folks in San Diego who hosted the conference did it on a, you know, and we watched on a Sunday morning. And I was amazed at the amount of loyalty people who followed the German team or the Uruguayan team right. had. And, and it was not, there weren't a lot of German HR people there. Um, but but there were a lot of folks internationally yeah. who supported the German team. Similarly, there weren't, I don't think there was anybody from Uruguay there, but there were supporters of the Uruguayan right. team, and, and they were all over it, man. It's unique. Americans, we don't uh, completely comprehend the world football culture mm -hmm. and that mm -hmm. scene. I This weekend, just, you know, and I'm not a big soccer fan, I don't follow it closely, but because it's the World Cup, I watched uh, Germany and Mexico and, yeah. uh, in Russia. Right. You know, so you're watching Germany and Mexico and Russia, and the fans, the, you know, it was crazy. And, and along with you, not all of them were from Germany or Mexico, but, you know, you got to think there were Russians and other people there who, hey, I've chosen to support this team, and the, the audience participation is impressive. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know the Mexican team got fined, right? No, I didn't know that. They got fined because there's a particular song 
uh, that supporters of the Mexican team sing uh, to the goalie of the other team. Yeah. And it's, uh, it's sung in Spanish. And uh, it's not complimentary. Not at all. In fact, it's extremely homophobic, the song. Oh, really? Yes, according to my husband, who understands such things. And so the, the Mexican team was fined for the behavior of their supporters. That's always a unique thing. You know, you always wonder, is that fair? Or, but how else do you, you know, do you set a tone that something's not going to be acceptable in basketball? That, that happens as well, that uh, if, if something is thrown on the court, mm -hmm. sometimes a technical will be assessed to the home team. Um, Even you know, if it was somebody in the stands that did it? Yeah, yes. Yeah, if, 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 if the crowd gets to a certain point where they're throwing things on the court or, you know, there's some type of behavior like that that causes a delay or is inappropriate, you can award a, a technical foul football. I've seen the same thing happen, that the crowd... So you could, if you were devious enough, go to a visiting, be a visitor team, go to the home team and probably get them a penalty. But I think you'd probably get caught. But I think I, I cannot imagine athletes, athletes uh, indulging in such shady behavior. I, that just goes against everything I was taught as a young uh, high school and college athlete. Uh, I bet it goes against everything you were taught. Yeah, yeah, you know, in the crowd, I mean, athletes make mistakes and athletes look for advantages and athletes lose their cool too. But, you know, typically athletes want the fans to enjoy the game and, and definitely not cause a penalty for either team. Yeah. yeah. And it's rare, but it just, as you mentioned, that song from the um, Mexico, and that's interesting because that was a neutral side game. Mm -hmm. But they knew whose fans were singing the song and they knew it was inappropriate. And so... Uh, they find that team, yeah. and the hope is that, that that hurts that team enough that they will somehow reach out to their fans and say, listen, this is inappropriate, we won't tolerate it. Yeah. And that's the only way, because how do you, you know, they, they have no leverage over a group of fans. Right. So you have to go after the team. Right. I remember a case, again, I was there. Um, I don't, I'm not a fan of, of many teams or sports in particular, except that I really like the Minnesota Twins. Okay. Because they have hope. They, <laughs> they play with hope. Um, anyway, I, I was at a particular game uh, where the, the Twins were the home team, um, and they would have had to do about 100% better in order to suck. I mean, they were just, <laughs> they were giving the game away. And there were a group, it was a home game, and there were, uh, was a group of people that came not with me, but from the college I was teaching at. And they were tossing pennies onto the field from high up so that if they, if they hit uh, one of the athletes, they would have done some right. serious damage. And uh, the umpires called the game um, and said, this game is not continuing until we are sure that there isn't going to be any more right. of this kind of action on the field. And the, the group of students that did it were escorted from the arena. Um, and I will tell you what happened in 60 seconds, because we need to take a break. Right. I just heard from the, uh, uh, from the booth. So we will be back in 60 seconds to talk more about uh, misbehavior in sports. Uh, I'm Cheryl Crozier Garcia with Coach V, and this is Working Together on Think Tech Hawaii. We will be right back. Hey, aloha, Stan Energy Man here on Think Tech Hawaii, where community matters. This is the place to come to think about all things energy. We talk about energy for the grid, energy for vehicles, energy in transportation, energy in maritime, energy in aviation. We have all kinds of things on our show, but we always focus on hydrogen here in Hawaii because it's my favorite thing. That's what I like to do. But we talk about things that make a difference here in Hawaii, things that should be a big changer for Hawaii, uh, and we hope that you'll join us every Friday at noon on Stand Energy Man and take a look with us at new technologies and new thoughts on how we can get clean and green in Hawaii. Aloha. Hi, I'm Pete McGinnis Mark, and every Monday at 1 o'clock, I'm the host of Think Tech Hawaii's Research in Manoa. And at that program, we bring to you a whole range of new scientific results from the university 
ranging from everything from exploring the solar system to looking at the Earth from space, going underwater, talking about earthquakes and volcanoes, and other things which have a direct relevance not only to Hawaii, but also to our economy. So please try and join me, one o'clock on a Monday afternoon to Think Tech Hawaii's Research in Manoa, and see you then. Hi, Cheryl Crozier Garcia here again. Uh, this is Working Together on Think Tech Hawaii. I'm here with Coach V, and we are talking about sportsmanship in all areas of life. Um, and I, I just, uh, you and I were talking about baseball. Right. So let me finish the story. Uh, the students that had uh, done this particular behavior were escorted from the arena. And uh, so I was in class the, the next day, and we were, People were kind of talking about it, and I was, and I found out that those those kids were some of them were in my class. Really, they were so upset that they had been essentially kicked out of the game. And I looked at them and I, I said, "You know, you could have killed somebody, right? You know that when you drop something small like that from a height." where you guys were sitting, when it hits the ground, it's doing 110 miles an hour, and that's fast enough to put a hole in somebody's head and kill them. Right. You, you know that, right? And they're like, well, they suck. No, <laughs> no, it's not about them sucking at this point. That's a criminal behavior. You're damn lucky that you weren't escorted out of the arena and into a holding cell. You could have been arrested for that. Yeah, and it, it's prevalent all across the country. That there have been incidences with snowballs, ice balls that are thrown at football games, very famous ones where people have been hit. Um, it used to be beer bottles, uh, but now I, I think most uh, arenas and stadiums have gone to only the aluminum cans or even the cans that kind of are in the bottle shape. Mm -hmm. Because a big, you know, a glass bottle, you wing one of those at somebody, they can really do some damage. I don't think you see bottles sold anymore or they're poured in a cup, a plastic mm -hmm. cup. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, I think they've taken a lot of precautions because officials and, and everybody knows that regardless of the outcome of the game, the safety of, of the spectators, and, and of the athletes are our primary concern. Right, and I think, Coach, that you and I would agree that doing things like throwing stuff at the players and things like that would be uh, representations of incredibly poor sportsmanship. Yeah, and typically it's, it's poor sportsmanship, it's, it's poor judgment, and about 95% of the time it's alcohol-induced. <laughs> um, which is just a part of sports as well. That's, that's a, a topic for another show, but you know that's a little bit of liquid courage that some people usually get when it comes time to yeah to, to let something fly and or an liquid arena. stupidity. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, but for every example of poor sportsmanship like that, there's an example of good sportsmanship, and we have a tape that has gone viral in social media um, that the guys in the booth are getting ready to uh, spool up for us and play. Let's take a look at that, and we can, we can narrate over um, what we're seeing. So this is a, a high school baseball game someplace in the continental U.S. Um, and you see the pitcher struck out a, a friend of his, and it allowed them to win the championship. And, and for just a minute there, he started celebrating and then he, uh, he makes his way to home plate and, and, and hugs a friend. So really touching moment. Uh, yeah, that's, that's the kind of sport I would like to see. Yeah. Um, and, and we've seen other examples of that. There was the case of the, the uh, female yep. softball Up player. Up in Western Oregon, we were talking about that earlier, where a, a, a female hit a, a home run to win the ball game, and she was rounding first. I believe I've got the facts right, and when she rounded first, at a slow pace, because when you run a home run, you, it's just a trot, you're not being chased, and hurt her knee and was unable to go around. And the rule book says that to score that run, you have to touch all the bases, including home plate. And so two pl opposing players picked her up and took her and touched her foot on second, third, and home base for her to win. Uh, for that team to win and for her to complete it. it. It would have been illegal for her to get assistance from her own team. Right. And uh, I happened to know the Western Oregon coach and, and had a little insight. And 
Uh, that went viral, and they went on a nationwide tour and spoke at schools. They went to the White House. As people, you know, people thrive on that. As much as people love to watch their team win, and they love competition, and you love bragging rights, those moments where sports becomes more about humanity and more about our interconnectedness as people, mm -hmm. um, it's even, you know, more valuable. I just uh, about a, a month ago went to China for um, for three weeks and trained with the Chinese national team, the under-18 team. Mm -hmm. And then we took that team to a Mannheim, Germany and played in a tournament. Whoa. So if you can picture me, tall, skinny, long-nosed guy with the Chinese team going in in Germany to play against the Egyptian team or the <laughs> Italian team, we've wow. had this very international flavor. But what spawned me to mention that to you is that really, for me, at, at, at my old age, resonated uh, just how sports can connect people. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I don't have a great story of good sportsmanship there other than just uh, those young men interacting and meeting each other and connecting and, you know, hey, you're from Egypt, I'm from China, I'm from the United States. But we all have this together and, and it, it forms a unique bond. Mm -hmm. Were they tall, those Chinese yes, players? Yes, the Chinese players have some very tall teams. I, I know that. Uh, you know, there's there's a little bit of a stereotype there that, you know, that the Asian culture, and I think some of the other Asian cultures, countries don't have that, but the Chinese have some big players. I got to meet Yao Ming, if you oh, remember, wow. the seven yeah. foot six. Yeah. He came and watched our practice one day. Wow. But China, and um, in the cafeteria at the training center we were at, the women's team, now I was with the men's team 18 and under, but the women's national team was there, mm -hmm. and so they were in their 20s mostly, and they're as tall as me. They're 6'4", six, 6'5", six, so there's some, some tall, very talented Chinese women as well. Well, good. So there's hope for the future. Yes, they're uh, excited. So, they're... so basketball is alive and well and, and has future athletes coming up along. It does, and, and uh, China in particularly loves the NBA. It is their favorite sport. They most Chinese people could not name a single college. They've never heard of Kentucky. They've never heard of Kansas. <laughs> but they can tell you players on the Lakers team, and they love LeBron and Steph Curry, and they really follow the NBA. Wow. Well, maybe I should start following the NBA, too. <laughs> but no, but no. I'll stay with my Twinkies. Okay. They yeah. play for hope, with hope. That's right. And playing with hope is important, because they don't give up. That's right. Like, ever. Um, and hopefully... The soccer players in the U.S. and abroad won't give up hope either. There's hope for their sport. I think so. I think, you know, we started this discussion looking at, at, at corruption in, in athletics. is no different than corruption on Wall Street or corruption in any industry. And uh, other industries that have that bounce back and survive, and athletics will continue to have corruption just like all other industries will. But hopefully it's the, it's the athletes and the coaches that have the passion for the game that will overcome the, the greedy motives at the top. You know, that's a great place to end this discussion. We, we could go on all day because you're fun to talk to, but we are running out of time. And so uh, what I'd like to say today is, um, to those of you, especially little kids out there, you future athletes, you, know, you look at soccer or you look at whatever sport and you idolize the people that you see playing that sport, don't let the business corruption and the administrative mistakes stop you from going out and playing with your team and being the absolute best athlete that you can be, because you have an opportunity to change the face of your sport. So that's all the time we have today for working together on Think Tech Hawaii. I'm Cheryl Crozier Garcia, and we will be back in two weeks. Till then, take care.